let's move to uh, the thematic sessions uh, for this morning. Um, and uh, uh, in our first uh, theme, we want to address the SDG agenda, health, food, agriculture, and many issues that were raised this morning. Uh, let me invite as the first intervention, um, uh, a friend, Damianti Bachori, Chairman, Center for Transdisciplinary and Sustainable Sciences, ITB University. Uh, and she was, of course, the lead co-chair Task Force on Food Security and Sustainable Agriculture. So, Damianti, over to you. I think in, in this uh, opportunity, it is it is very um, wonderful to hear these three, um, the healing, harmony, and hope. And also it goes on together with the one earth, one family, and, and one future. Um, and we have heard from, um, we have heard also how the future is still, according to Pa Yose, it's, it's, we're still facing the same challenges of uh, global security that will still be challenged in this uh, T20 leadership of, of India. So in the light of this, the same challenges, but maybe there will be a new twist, of course, in this, uh, the T20. Um, how is it that we can achieve global security, healing, hope, when we have a um, Hopefully not, but if we have a recession, finan financial crisis. Um, therefore, global partnership, as was mentioned before, becomes more important. And this global partnership is not only at the governmental level, but it should trickle down to all levels, either it's the um, NGO, universities, um, people to people, um, civil society partnership should work together toward this healing, harmony, and hope. I believe we can do it together, um, especially with the Troika, uh, Indonesia, India, and Brazil. It, India, Indonesia, Brazil will give hope for the future through this um, T20, G20, um, that will be the core of our mission in this next year. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor. Uh, let me invite the next speaker, Hasbullah Thabrani, Chairman, Center for Health Administration and Policy Studies. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, there you are. That's amazing. Sorry. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I've been um, organizing uh, many, many meetings on the uh, SDG for the universal health coverage. I think that's uh, important um, information for all of us uh, since the SDG it is uh, setting that it is set that by 2030 they kept waiting all countries uh, reaching universal health coverage however however in my observation including India and Indonesia from our analysis um, these um, Achievement of the USC in terms of measure of indicators still not uh, um, close to the, the 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 target of the goal. The indicator for this uh, SDG universal health coverage is out of pocket payment uh, for healthcare. Um, in contrast with the income, so most. Uh, Low-income countries still have high out-of-pocket payment. Uh, why it is important? Because out-of-pocket payment for healthcare, because healthcare is uncertain. Unlike food, for example, or, or transportation, we can we can plan how much uh, people will uh, consume in the next year, next month, and so on. But healthcare is certainly very uncertain, and therefore it is not uh, being able to consume by uh, individual, uh, by household. Um, the USC. Um, measure the out-of-pocket as a portion of the uh, household income. So the measurement is that if a household spend more than 10% of household income, it's con considered catastrophic health spending. It's considered impoverizing the people. And therefore, it is used by the uh, WHO and the World Bank to monitor how far. I think both of our countries still have high <laughs> out of pocket uh, and uh, impoverishing uh, the people uh, because of that one. The market mechanism certainly fail 
to ensure that everyone get health care they need and the health care, the healthy uh, body is essential uh, to produce uh, <laughs> economic production, uh, social production, education, with whatever. And therefore, this uh, UAC um, in the health sector, I think, need to be uh, uh, continued to be uh, promoted or discussed and find out how we can achieve that level by 2030. Um, working together, especially in low middle income countries that far behind from the target. I personally don't believe that low middle income countries can, all, all middle income countries can reach your universal health coverage by 2030, but we can do our best uh, to achieve uh, the best possible. Uh, I think that's just for the beginning. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you, Professor Asbullah. Uh, let me now move to our uh, next speaker, uh, Professor Tadas, um, Research and Information Systems. All right. Uh, good morning to all of you. SDGs uh, has been the focal point of discussion of the G20 deliberations, as we know since 2015, when they were adopted uh, under the Addis Ababa Action Agenda. Uh, every year, uh, the uh, achievement, uh, the gaps have been discussing uh, since then. And uh, initial years, uh, there appeared to be some progress. Uh, but uh, subsequently, I think uh, they were lagging behind uh, the envisaged targets. Uh, and of course, now in the last two years, the world is affected by the COVID, uh, which has uh, uh, reversed the, the achievements to a great extent. I think you know, this also has been acknowledged in the Indonesian uh, deliberations during its presidency. And uh, many you know, recommendations have been made in the, the Indonesian summit declaration as also in the T20 deliberations. Now, I think you know, going forward, uh, what is required, and as uh, rightly pointed out by the Indonesian esteemed members here, that we have only a half uh, way mark to go. We have already spent about seven years, and we have eight years to reach 2030. Uh, now that we are much behind uh, the schedule uh, and uh, there is a huge shortfall, not only in terms of the STG gaps, but also in terms of financing, uh, there is time uh, if we have to achieve by 2020 at any cost. In fact, some of the members expressed their doubts that whether we will be able to achieve or not. Uh, I think, you know, uh, it is always easy to defer uh, the goals, achievement, but we should stick to the target of 2030. We should see that what are the options available uh, so that we are able to uh, reach uh, the, the goals uh, as expected of all the G20 uh, members. Uh, now, I think the main issues are that, you know, we have seen that uh, various efforts have been uh, taken uh, by the, the international community, the multilateral development banks, and the DAC member countries to enhance uh, the assistance to the developing countries uh, so that you know, they have resources uh, to progress in various SDG uh, goals. Uh, but then you know, that has not been adequate and uh, sufficient. And uh, there have also been suggestions to uh, augment the the uh, the balance sheet uh, based uh, lending by these uh, institutions uh, i think you know although it is acknowledged that there is a scope to enhance assistance uh, under this window but uh, uh, not much ha action has uh, taken place as uh, uh, you know as in this regard now i think you know we have to go beyond as was pointed out uh, by one of the members uh, we have to go beyond uh, the MDBs, we have to go beyond uh, DAC members, and we have to see that uh, the, the uh, developing countries themselves make more efforts by uh, you know, thinking of uh, raising resources either domestically or uh, you know, uh, changing uh, lifestyles, which will in fact, uh, as uh, uh, Chairman uh, uh, T20 Ambassador Susan Churai mentioned, that they will complement the achievement of SDGs. 
So I think, you know, uh, India as a presidency of uh, G20 this year uh, will have uh, to think of uh, various uh, options and how to forge ahead uh, with uh, alternatives to see that we are able to achieve the goals uh, by 2030 uh, without, you know, further deferring uh, the, the goals. I'll stop here. I'll, uh, Thank you. Uh, I, I think you've raised a pertinent point on financing development um, uh, uh, ambitions and how do we raise new finance, how do we change domestic approaches to creating more capabilities in that particular sector. Let me now uh, request my colleagues to play the uh, uh, presentation by Professor Jeffrey Sachs. First, congratulations to Indonesia on a wonderful T20 process that was very enriching and that led to a superb communique. Uh, it was a very participatory process and uh, brilliantly led. And I, I'm sure uh, that uh, India T20 will be absolutely splendid and wonderful. Let me say right at the outset, please count on me for anything I can do personally and anything that I can do in my capacity is president of the United Nations Sustainable Development Solutions Network, or SDSN, which has 1,700 mostly university members uh, around the world, and including uh, what are millions of students in those universities. So engaging the universities in the T20 process through SDSN is something I'd love to do in any way that uh, you would like. And also SDSN has any capacity to host meetings, to help support logistics, to organize sessions on particular topics, you name it, please count on me. I think the T20 process is extremely important and uh, very invigorating. So uh, I'm excited to do whatever I can. I want to mention two of the uh, themes that uh, India T20 has already identified as uh, of special interest for me and I think uh, of particular interest for the T20 process. One is the reform, the overhaul of the global financial architecture so that it is a more inclusive architecture and so that uh, the developing countries and particularly the low income and lower middle income developing countries, which together constitute half the world's population, have access to development finance on decent terms. Because the way the global financial architecture works right now is that at least half the world is basically subjected to miserable borrowing conditions, very short term uh, loans, very high interest rates, very unstable capital flows. Uh, very high risks of default as a result of that or of debt crisis. And this is not financing the SDGs or the energy transformation or climate adaptation or other very high priorities. I'm working with the UN leadership, with Secretary General Guterres and Deputy Secretary General Amina Mohammed on what we call the SDG stimulus, which is to get more quality development finance in support of the SDGs and the Paris agenda. This could involve a massive expansion of the balance sheets of the multilateral development banks or of other public development banks or other DFIs. But this is the aim because we need long term finance at low interest rates and for high or long maturities to finance what is essentially an investment agenda, uh, because the SDGs in Paris are about investing in education, investing in healthcare, investing in green energy, investing in sustainable agriculture, investing in urban infrastructure, investing in climate ad adaptation and resilience, investing in digital access and services, but it's investment. And that means finance. And since it's development finance, it means that we need long term lending at interest rates comparable to the AAA borrowing 
uh, that the rich countries uh, obtain, but that the poor countries right now do not. So that's one theme that I really hope we can focus on. There will be a huge amount of international interest. The G20 is tasked with this. COP28 will be considering climate finance. The IMF is looking at reform issues, whether another round of SDRs or its new RST. The multilateral development banks are being pushed rightly to expand their balance sheets. I want to push their uh, boards also to fund these institutions more adequately so that they protect the high uh, credit worthiness and uh, strong uh, ratings of these organizations so that they can intermediate loans on good terms for their member uh, borrowers. So that's one issue. The second issue that I think is extremely important is reform of multilateralism more generally. Multilateralism is fraught, of course, by big power confrontation, the proxy war in effect uh, in Ukraine, the tensions between the US and China. I have a lot of thoughts about this. I think the US should calm down and cooperate better. That's my own personal view and negotiate a lot more than it does. But the point is we need to strengthen multilateralism. Uh, we need to end the wars and the hot wars, the cold wars, and refocus uh, these energies on sustainable development. I think it's possible. I think the T20 can play a role as it did in the T20 Indonesia in focusing on strengthening multilateralism, WTO reform, UN Security Council reform. I have long recommended and strongly urged that the G20 become the G21 with the addition of the African Union as the 21st chair, just like the European Union. That would bring in 1.4 billion people into the process with one additional chair and a significant uh, part of the world economy uh, and a significant voice that needs to be heard at uh, the G20 process. So that's another aspect of multilateralism. And I think we could on take up the theme also of reform of the G20 process itself, not only with the additional member, but I think the T20, the B20, the uh, uh, finance ministers group, the foreign ministers group, uh, the urban 20 and so forth could really work closely together in the coming year on some of the key issues. That would be quite good for the G20, T20, B20 to be highly interactive at senior level, working on some of these core thematic issues. So I think even the reform of how the G20 process uh, works uh, effectively um, and can work even more effectively is important for the T20. I'm a firm believer in the G20 process. I think it's extremely exciting that we have uh, four years in a row of uh, major developing countries at the helm. Indonesia, India, Brazil, and South Africa, we could get a lot of reform done for uh, making the global system work for all. Uh, Indonesia has made a great contribution to that, and I know India is going to do a spectacular job as well. So thank you for letting me make these very brief remarks. Uh, I'll be on a plane as you meet, but uh, uh, thinking of you, and uh, I look forward to uh, contributing in any and every way uh, that uh, will be helpful to the process. All best wishes uh, to, uh, to friends uh, in the gathering. Thanks uh, so much. So what I'll uh, do is, uh, uh, I'm going to make a little bit of a departure from the published agenda, because since uh, he spoke a lot on uh, um, reforming the financial order, um, I will bring uh, uh, Professor Ashima Goyal as well as Professor Deepak Mishra into the conversation at this stage. Professor Goyal, can I turn to you first on um, the reforms of the financial order and all oh, the other thank ambitions? Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. 
So it is it is good to uh, you know my first experience of uh, of this uh, process and uh, the thoughts voiced were all very inspiring. It is really good to be reminded that we are one family on earth and face a common future that we create and that it can be much better if we work together. I think Indonesia made an invaluable contribution in keeping dialogue and agreement going in very difficult circumstances. So um, G20 as a whole has made major uh, contribution in crisis times. Through the years, whenever we've had crisis, the global financial crisis started with that, and currently the vaccination program, et cetera, debt. But in the more uh, this finance uh, track and the kind of uh, issues uh, Professor Sachs took up, among the these these other broader issues, um, I think the major progress has been in BEPS, you know, the base erosion and profit shifting tax issues. And the reason is that this is one area where every every nation gains. But in the global financial order, there has been very little progress since uh, interests are regarded as conflicting. And there has been very little protection or preemptive action for uh, for emerging markets who face tremendous uh, global risk on risk offs. And uh, we've done some research which shows that in the 2010s, growth halved for 10 major emerging markets compared to the previous decade. In fact, I started working on or reading about the international financial order ever since the South Asian crisis where Indonesia was one of the worst affected. And that time when I went to various central bank sites of these countries, I found that they're so committed to openness and want to do what is required to participate. They were very willing to undertake whatever reform suggestions were made to strengthen the regulation of their financial sectors, etc. But there were so many reform suggestions, including from Professor Sachs, Professor Stiglitz and others, for the global financial order, but um, nothing was implemented. Only one collective action clause that Annie Kruger pushed. So, uh, and I think that if some of these reform suggestions had been taken seriously and implemented, we might have been spared the global financial crisis or it might have been mitigated. So there are tremendous costs to this uneven power in the world and the uh, you know, the absence of uh, real reform in areas where advanced countries see the advantage is threatened. So in the global financial crisis, similarly, since most of the problems for advanced, which originated in advanced economies and, and where their banks were affected, most of the reform was for banks, capital adequacy, et cetera, strengthening, regulation strengthening. And this really, uh, they have been very stable through the current waves of uh, tightening and quantitative easing and then tightening. And again, surges in capital flows. Much of the flows to emerging markets are not, not, not cross-border. But obviously, if you're going to regulate one part of the financial sector, there's huge arbitrage towards shadow banks. And a lot of the funds we have seen coming in have been through um, hedge funds, etc., shadow banks generated. It is like, uh, you know, there's this story about uh, a staircase which is painted and somebody is parked there to warn people not to touch the railings. And people forget, and that person is there and warning uh, even after the, the railings are dry. So it is through that uh, function follow structure. And if we don't reform international institutions, then the response to crisis and to global requirements is going to be inadequate. But I think there are four considerations that make change more feasible today as India assumes the G20 presidency. One, there are huge new challenges, including climate change, financing for net zero, for SDGs, et cetera. For, and for all of these, these are global public goods. Collective action is required. Global coordination is essential. Otherwise, we cannot make progress. So um, there is a realization that something needs to be done seriously. And the second, uh, second change is that emerging market size and aggregate has more than doubled. It's more than 50%. So the feedback from what happens to emerging markets to global growth and prospects is very large. 
And that makes it a little bit more in advanced economies' own interests to preserve developing country growth. And there is more convergence of interests in that sense, as well as uh, emerging market bargaining power rises. And this leads to the third, you know, that agenda setting powers. As we have noted throughout this period of uh, G20, only four times emerging markets have been in the chair. And the agenda has largely been set by advanced economies. But now we have, where starting with Indonesia, we have four emerging markets going to take up the, the lead. And, and we should see some progress in, uh, in issues that would improve global stability, global funding, and therefore improve outcomes for everybody. The last change I would like to flag is that there is an explosion in the use of data and potential for data-based financial innovations. This can be, these, these features can be used to stretch or leverage uh, the finance available with, with, with the international institutions to make more, more available for the essential uh, uh, areas where spending has to rise. And along with that, a proposed action can be shown to benefit more countries. There can be a push from reputation effects, from a rise in bargaining power. And also, I think when we talk about you know, healing and harmony, that is very important, especially after a year of seeing a terrible war and its side effects in human suffering, unnecessary destruction. I think, again, again, we unfortunately in global history, we go into these wars and we learn that wars cannot solve anything. So as our Prime Minister said, it's not a time for war, it's a time to cooperate, to work together, to heal large global problems, to find solutions. And I hope that this year we will see some action on this. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Goel. I think I take away uh, your key message here, can the financial system work for people and planet? Um, and uh, can we bring greater agency and equity in how we actually uh, set the agenda and operate the financial system? I think that's the key message and perhaps something to change during the presidency. Let me turn to um, uh, uh, Professor Deepak Mishra. Yeah, thank you, Samir. Uh, I, so I hope you can hear me. Yeah. Okay, uh, it's wonderful to be here. You know, thanks, Samir, uh, Sachin, uh, Mr. Chinoy. I thought you have to have a name starting with S to be part of the wise group of people, Mr. Sat uh, Satnam Sandhu, but then Mr. Arvind Gupta and Rohan Chetli made that break the jinx. But uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. I, um, I wanted to make uh, two broad observations. So first is just talking about the global financial order, which is the... Uh, uh, which is the task force that I will be part of along with uh, Ms. Uh, Dr. Goel. Um, I, you know, and then second, I'll talk some basic issues on G20 issues as we see it uh, from the work that we do at ICREA, which is the economic think tank in Delhi. Um, so first thing is when you t talk about global financial order and reforming multilateral institutions, I haven't heard a single person who says we shouldn't reform it. And this has been going on for ages, but yet there is no reform. So you'd say, like, how can this be? Who says, I don't want to have more development financing? Who says we don't want more innovative financing or reforming multilaterals or redefining the role of regional and plurilateral financing institutions? Pretty much everyone agrees. So what's the real issue here? And somebody who worked in the World Bank for 20 years, I know even staff in the World Bank wants this place to be reformed. So why is this not happening? I think, obviously, like any, any typical uh, reform, uh, the political economy, economy matters. The people, the incumbent beneficiary countries uh, who have benefited from the last 70 years of the global current global order are willing to give up and the, uh, the rising powers wants to have a bigger say in the global system and they've been denied. And I think G20 is a terrific platform to push this agenda harder. Um, and I think India being a democracy, fastest growing developing country uh, with a very strong leadership has a really golden opportunity to push this agenda, which has been a jinxed agenda for a very long time. So what can we do? I mean, obviously, we are a tiny, small part in this big uh, 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 wheel of uh, 
global architecture. But we, I think at least we'll be talking to Ashima and others to have all these ideas. But I think there are a couple of things that people have talked about which we must do to make sure that we have some tangible outcome at the end of this process. I think we need to first pick few topics, be very selective in what this task force is going to focus on and not take on the whole agenda. And glad that the, uh, the outline of this is actually very focused because there are actually three interrelated task force dealing with this. Uh, one is on global financial architecture, the other one is on um, transforming global institutions and framework, and the third one is on macro, which also has a lot of in institutional and international coordination issues. So in a sense, I think we need to make sure that we pick the right ones which we can deliver. I think second is we really need very concrete action plans to begin with. Uh, so, and there are lots of terrific ideas that has been under discussion. So we need to really focus quickly and pick a few of those ideas that are really concrete, actionable, monitorable, and objective so that they can be delivered. And I think uh, the third I would say is from a, because we are a big country, we have a large task force, it could be very easy to be inward looking and kind of have a consensus within India. I think it's pretty critical that we'll look outside from very early and involve some of the important global actors in this. I think, you know, Professor Sachs talks very eminently about some of those issues, but there are lots of people out there uh, who are very keen for this thing to reform, and they come from whole, you know, every parts of the world economy. So we must involve uh, those people as we progress on this. So in some sense, being selective, being very concrete and being more consultative is the way I would suggest at least our task force will proceed. Um, then quickly to turn to few kind of broader issues on, on G20 that because I have the mic, I'll take two more minutes to say on that. I think the first is, uh, uh, I, I'd make three observations on the broader G20 and in career we have been working on this issues for a very long time. I'm grateful that you, know, you um, uh, ask uh, me to, along with Dr. Goel, to work on the task force. Uh, on the global financial order, but we have Professor Nisha Taneja, uh, Radhika uh, Kapoor, and uh, Dr. Mansi uh, Kedia, who are the co-chairs, and we are happy to add to the diversity of the task force uh, members here. And we are really delighted and we are all in to help make sure that we have a terrific G20 and a terrific uh, T20. Uh, I want to talk on three things on, on broader uh, G20 issues, uh, process, people, and uh, and product. I think the first is on the process. I mean, you have seen this today, this big ad on newspapers where you know, perhaps, uh, Prime Minister Modi talks about how G20 is going to be action-oriented, focused, and all that stuff. I think given the oldest democracy in the world and the largest and you know, being one of the fastest growing uh, economy with a lot of self-confidence, I think this is going to be a terrific G20 in many ways. Um, uh, because, I mean, and I've been in the other side watching G20 from Washington DC and others and G20 can be a very nerdy place with uh, lots of smart economists coming and talking about very uh, complex, difficult issues. But I think, uh, India will be the first G20 members who is really going to take the G20 to the masses and not keep it confined to the classes. Um, so I feel that's going to be. And second is the G20 architecture is so inclusive. I mean, if you look at the architecture, the World Bank, IMF, uh, WHO, WTO, nobody has an inclusive architecture that G20 has. G20 is a big tent. It invites everybody to be inside it. And I think India is going to take advantage of it. So everybody um, uh, who knows anything on G20, I presume, will ultimately uh, be involved and have a say on this process. So this is, in some sense, I think the process is really set well to make a very successful G20. I think then it comes to the products or the substance that we are going to sell to the world. I think there's a plenty of problems around the world, you know, from debt relief to climate change to digital economy to reforming multilateral systems. So each one can be a hero. If we can really invest well, each of this reform or even picking one and succeeding, it could be a huge contribution to the global economy. So there's a India is set in a difficult, challenging context, but it's only in those contexts that heroes arise. So I feel that uh, being in that place provides the India with the opportunity to actually come and find tangible solutions to the, some of the global problem. The second is the G20 um, story today, what we are really worried about, are also very aligned with India's own de development aspirations, including the aspirations of the developing countries. So in that sense, I feel the agenda, the priorities, the issues that we have discussed 
will be very, uh, so there won't be a uh, decoupling between what India wants versus what the developing countries want. So this, you know, recoupling would actually make it a much more substantive G20 than before. And final point on people, and this is, I want to just focus on the T20. I know that, uh, you know, t managing T20 can be a Herculean task. I know, you know, thanks to all of you guys for stepping in and doing this. You know, there could be a whole host of issues that other might think about, but I think this is a time to bury any difference, put a foot together um, and come up with a very, uh, uh, you know, helpful and uh, productive uh, discussion among this. So this is the time for us to uh, really bury any of our differences and uh, put our best foot forward to make sure that we all contribute in a positive way and to a full potential. Thank you, Deepak, both on the content part and the, the institutional part for the T20. And we look forward to your contributions through the year. Um, let me now uh, move back to the original agenda. Uh, ha having discussed the financial order and, and uh, reforms that are required there, let's go back to uh, where I had deviated and uh, let's discuss green transitions and climate mainstreaming. Since I'm uh, going to be alongside her in, in, in leading this particular task force, I can just very quickly mention uh, two or three areas that we really want to pursue. One of them has been discussed enough and I won't belabor the point, but how do we uh, crowd in large amount of financial flows? patient capital and uh, uh, equity and investments into uh, these uh, efforts in the emerging and developing world will remain an important element of how we study uh, this particular task force. Uh, how can institutional reforms, how can, as uh, Jeffrey Sachs mentioned, how can uh, the cost of capital itself, the borrowing rate, be reduced uh, in uh, emerging geographies where, for example, South Africa pays 9% um, uh, loading on 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 borrowings by uh, developed countries. How do we reduce the cost of capital so that these countries can do more uh, to contribute to the environment? For example, if India has the potential to reduce one third of all future emissions, why does India have to pay thirty to forty percent more to set up a green? A, a, a renewable energy plant. Uh, so is the case with abatement, hard to abate sectors like steel, cement, etc. Why should we be borrowing capital for a project that is serving global good? It's a global good project. And I think that question of climate finance and repricing capital, catalyzing greater flows, uh, creating capacities in the developing countries, and that is equally important. Even if global financial flows were to reach India, do we have the capacity to absorb them and deploy them in Indonesia and South Africa and Brazil and other countries? So how do we create a whole new architecture of funnels and receptacles that can catalyze the largest a global flow of capital required if we are to fight climate change. I think that's one big area. But beneath that, there are sub-stories that we will chase, green mobility and transportation opportunities, habitats and smart cities and urban and, and urban um, developments that could be green, uh, industries and their role. We don't want it to be just an energy-centered discussion. Green transitions is far broader. The world is obsessed just with energy. So how do you uh, look at the various other non-fashionable aspects of transitions that are equally um, uh, useful in, in, in abating uh, emissions? And that's going to be the second aspect uh, of uh, uh, the, the task force. But, but I think uh, what Ambassador Abe Thakur laid out this morning and, and uh, Ambassador Chinoy, uh, in a sense, complimented uh, his, uh, his um, approach is that uh, just transitions uh, may not be sufficient. We possibly require a global just transition, which means there have to be differential speeds for different geographies and different individuals and, and uh, countries with the means and countries uh, who are in a situation where they can do more must certainly be contributing and performing better uh, so as to allow others to catch up and, and reach that space where they can also uh, be a driver of these transitions. So I think uh, the equity element within the green transitions um, is going to be equally important. And this is going to be across the verticals of issues that we are going to discuss on climate transitions. Uh, so I'm going to leave it here because we have other speakers to go. But I think I just, I just thought that uh, green transitions is not just about fancy technology access, but how to mainstream it and make it, and make it affordable 
and accessible to the largest cohort of humans who have been outside the development space till now. And I think that's the bigger challenge. The justice element, not from a Western definition, uh, but from an equity argument needs to be embedded in the conversation. With that, let me move to uh, the next stage, uh, the next conversation that we wanted to seed. Uh, and uh, maybe we could have a broader uh, inputs from and, uh, others who may want to contribute. Uttam, I know, but let me start with Ambassador Chinoy. And maybe your thoughts on uh, life. And and since uh, IDSA is going to be an anchor institute under yourself, uh, that is going to be supporting this. I thought maybe you and Uttam could maybe lay out some ideas on on what we could be doing on on the life task force. On uh, Over to you, sir. So I've heard uh, a great deal from a number of experts uh, and can only marvel at the fact that there is such uh, fertile, uh, you know, a febrile thinking which uh, enables us to uh, you know have that kind of uh, mental amplitude but the proof of the pudding is in the eating and uh, the one single thought that I want to present today is this notion of a personal net zero in fact uh, the more I think about this the more I'm excited myself because a top-down approach uh, at the national level may or may not work, given all the difficulties in financing, uh, bridging this huge gap between the developed and developing, uh, the general reluctance to fund anything, uh, you know, beyond your own territory, um, uh, the tendency to see the rest of the world as a, as a black hole. Um, I mean, this is not going to simply go away. You can't wish it away. So uh, whether the Indonesian... Uh, you know, presidency or ours, we will have to continue to grapple with this. But how about turning it around? And uh, speaking of uh, a personal net zero is what I'm proposing today. So can the Think20, each one of us wear a badge which says, uh, kind of, uh, we are committed to a personal net zero. Can a pledge be developed for India's G20 presidency, which is a pledge or an anthem for a personal net zero. Now, a personal net zero doesn't mean that you stop, uh, you know, having your barbecue in Australia, no more barbies for the Australians, no more four-wheel drives, uh, you know, th that's not what I'm suggesting. But can we distill something uh, between us as humanity, w each of us in our own, uh, you know, bubbles, in whatever part of the world we live, can we de-escalate? We may be having much higher standards of living in America and Germany and other parts of Europe, in Japan, but can we do something to scale that back? And I would see that as a personal contribution at the human beings level uh, to achieving net zero. I mean, that's what I think is the centrality of a lifestyle for the environment. This is not about equalizing. This is not about reducing everybody to the same denominator, which would be quite alarming in the West. Uh, but it is certainly uh, a voluntary, uh, very, very uh, individual commitment that you can, uh, you know, make. Uh, we should create that tug uh, at the very soul of every human being during our presidency. Are you willing? to scale back just a little bit. I read somewhere that a single shirt uh, takes 27 liters of water to manufacture. So, uh, and, and, the, and the manner in which we, you know, lead our lifestyles, there is so much that we can do to scale back. And I'm not about to suggest that we do a circular economy of the type that reduces global growth to, to, to zero levels because you need to continue to stimulate the global economy as well in terms of consumption a consumption-led, uh, you know, global growth. But let's, I think, dedicate ourselves to this notion. At least that's what I would say uh, as, uh, uh, you know, the chair for this uh, lifestyle for the environment. My motto from today is a personal net zero and how I can move inch forward towards that goal. Thank you. So uh, you have uh, provoked a friend, Aline, to uh, also add. So Aline, please go ahead. Okay, uh, thank you. So my position is, uh, I have two positions in T20, uh, become the executive coordinator of uh, T20, which is uh, uh, 
thinking about the, all the technical things and also co-chairs of Task Force Three, and it's very different roles. Uh, roles, yeah. <laughs> so uh, I'm preparing for for uh, my presentation after this about technical matter. So I'm switching uh, my mind to the content. Uh, yeah, uh, I think uh, for uh, T20 in the, uh, India. Uh, we we made uh, a task force note uh, for the uh, task uh, task force about climate governing climate change uh, energy transition and environmental uh, protection. Uh, first, my notes is uh, maybe we can highlight more on the circular economy side. So, the climate is uh, you know uh, over discussed. I think, <laughs> particularly on mitigation side. Uh, I agree. Uh, uh, with our discussion yesterday, uh, we have to look at ad adaptation. So how to make decarbonization works for development, how to insert uh, decarbonization to development agenda. Uh, and then uh, in, it also uh, later on uh, impact to the financing. But I think circular economy uh, will, will make a bigger impact in terms of uh, resource exploitation from resource exploitation side so we concerned about this uh, resource uh, uh, availability and also and the other side is environmental protection so highlighting this three decarbonization uh, resource exploitation and environmental protection uh, and putting it into like circular economy uh, term i think it uh, very important and then uh, i agree also with net zero uh, emission uh, not all countries have this uh, lts uh, lts plan and then but the problem is sometimes uh, when a country make this it is maybe not all aligned too much on uh, with with the uh, national development planning and it will impact the the budgeting uh, within a country itself it happened actually in indonesia we have lts ndc we have lcdi document how we can align it with our national uh, development planning and uh, we commit uh, through the budget and mobilizing uh, domestic uh, 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 private finance uh, including that and also uh, carbon pricing mm -hmm. I think uh, for developing countries it is uh, quite challenging uh, to uh, to form a, a better way in uh, for this carbon pricing instrument how to make it uh, compatible with with our situation, yeah, carbon tax, uh, car, uh, uh, ETS, and other thing, I think it is uh, quite important uh, to to uh, think about this carbon pricing instrument and about the JETP. The last one is I think we should learn from uh, South Africa, where this aid or or this uh, support embedded with this support is term and condition. So we have to look at more when we receive uh, a bunch of money and whether the term co of condition and condition is acceptable for us. Yeah, thank you. That's no, all. no, I think that's important uh, on a lighter note. Uh, by the way, thank you so much both Ambassador Chinoy and Aline for your in, uh, important intervention on this aspect.